All right, thank you so much for that introduction. I guess I have um, been outed as a uh, like a plaintiff's based lawyer at some point in my life. So, <laughs> um, so I have been um, uh, asked to, to uh, consider the daunting task of trying to discern if the Roberts Court is uh, pro business when it comes to class actions. Um, trying to make sense of really over a decade of um, this the, these cases, and it's really a tall order. So what I'd like to do is. I've tried to organize them a little bit thematically um, and tee them up for a uh, broader conversation with you um, today. I think some of them are particularly significant. One was mentioned the Walmart case and there are a couple of sort of uh, 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 big cases like that I'll focus on, but some, some other ones as well. So first of all, this notion of whether or not the business, the uh, Roberts Court is pro-business, um, it's certainly a mixed bag. Some cases you would um, say would be pro-business, others are not. Um, certainly the 5-4 opinions have gotten a lot of attention, the Walmarts, the Comcast, the Concepcions, and so forth. But a number of cases have been uh, unanimous opinions, 9-0 nine, nine decisions. Um, and the court has actually refrained from granting cert in, in a variety of cases that actually touch on class action jurisprudence and so has not in fact um, jumped into the landscape when it, when it could have. Uh, so there, there is, I would say, a legitimate concern about sort of high, higher obstacles, depending on where you are, I guess, concern versus um, maybe not so, not so concerned about whether or not class certification has in fact um, become more difficult. But it's certainly fair to say that class actions have survived um, despite those higher, uh, those higher hurdles. Uh, I do think that there's a trend here that um, the court has moved in when it comes to uh, the notion of uh, court access and making that harder, the access to the courts harder, uh, private enforcement of rights more difficult. Uh, and that's taking place not only in the class action context, but in a larger um, context. And I think some of you had alluded to that earlier in terms of pleadings and so forth. So it's happening certainly within a broader framework. So first of all, how did we get here? Um, why has the Roberts Court even um, considered so many class actions in the last 10 years? Sort of the, so the sheer volume of, of um, cases around class actions is new. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, we have Rule 23F um, has now allowed interlocutory appeal of class certification decisions, whether denials or grants, um, since 1998. And so in terms of the pipeline, that interlocutory decision has been sort of ripe for uh, review by the appellate courts. And so that is um, one reason that we see sort of, a, I think, more robust uh, jurisprudence when it comes to class actions. And it turns out that that has been um, uh, largely, I'd say, in favor of defendants or, or uh, has been sort of pro-business. As it turns out, uh, when you, there, there was a study that was done um, looking at uh, uh, cases from 1998 to 2012, um, of the 23 F appeals that were accepted, 70% were from defendants and 30% from plaintiffs. And of the appeals by defendants, defendants were successful 70% of the time and plaintiffs were uh, successful 30% of the time. So that pipeline um, that, and Rule 23 F interlocutory review has been uh, somewhat helpful to um, the, the defense bar. Another reason we're seeing just more class actions, um, I think, before the court is because of CAFA. So the Class Action Fairness Act of 2005, as you know, has expanded jurisdiction and federal jurisdiction for certain types of class actions. Um, and so they have moved, again, that pipeline. We have more that are being considered by the federal courts of appeals as well as the Supreme Court. And I think the Roberts Court is pretty serious about making sure that that federal ju jurisdiction is protected. So, for example, the first... Uh, the first uh, CAFA case that the court looked at, this is the standard fire versus Knowles, was a unanimous opinion uh, by the court, made it clear to the named plaintiff that, uh, that, that they could not avoid federal jurisdiction by stipulating that the amount in controversy was less than the $5 million threshold. So again, I think there, there are a number of cases related to CAFA that show that the court is serious about uh, that, that, that statute's primary objective, and that is to get interstate um, uh, cases of national importance into a federal forum. And then finally, why do we see more class actions in front of the Roberts Court? Some have just said it's because of the interest of the justices themselves. Uh, some have said that you know they have, they have been involved in litigation. Some have even taught civil procedures, so maybe it's something that they like. 
Um, some might be motivated by political leanings, whether conserv conservative or liberal, um, or they may be motivated by just the, um, as, a, as a branch of government in terms of the stagnation um, and the stalemate in Congress, and because of the sort of the partisan nature of Congress these days, that nothing much is happening on that front, and that the formal rulemaking committee, uh, the process with the advisory committee, that that process is cumbersome and quite slow, taking about three to four years for a rule, uh, a federal rule of civil procedure, in fact, to be amended. And so perhaps the court is filling in a gap there um, that exists because of all of those uh, reasons. I think one of the interesting things that comes out of looking at the class action jurisprudence from the Roberts Court is to try to figure out what role the, the court thinks that the class action plays, right? And we can look at that in different ways. And I think the court is um, uh, looking, rightfully looking at the class action as an exception to the general rule that an individual brings, um, you know, brings their case, uh, case on his or her own behalf. So typically that the plaintiff is the master of their claim. And because a representative action really runs counter to that general rule, um, that the court is is a protector and has to make sure that there is appropriate uh, rigorous criteria if you're going to um, depart from that norm and to make sure that that departure is justified. So this notion of the class action requiring a very rigorous analysis to make sure that we're in fact going to have a uh, certification would not be unusual and would be appropriate. So the challenge is trying to figure out whether or not the right balance has been struck. Um, where's the line in terms of rigor? How high should it be? How, how far have we gone? Um, it, it, you know, have we reached an appropriate level? So certainly, um, on the one hand, we think about the class action as a procedural asset, promotes efficiency and court access, um, enabling plaintiffs who have small claims and little resources to cull call their, um, their resources together to jointly challenge what they think might be widespread um, misconduct in the context of a single lawsuit. Um, and on the other hand, we have the idea that the class action is this procedural anomaly that should be granted only under limited circumstances um, and um, to, to really give um, effect to due process, right? So that rigorous standard allows defendants to adequately defend themselves and avoid being strong-armed into a settlement and gives class members an opportunity to bring individual claims when it turns out that their interests in fact do diverge. And we see that a lot when it comes to monetary relief. Um, so this question about whether or not that rigorous analysis has gone too far and ultimately become a barrier in terms of access to justice that could result in um, um, under enforcement of important statutes and um, policies coming out of Congress. So obviously we have these two competing norms, uh, two competing narratives um, that come up in the courts and come up before the court. On the one hand, we have this um, narrative that we have plaintiff's lawyers seeking class certification to promote frivolous lawsuits and extract lucrative settlements. Uh, and on the other hand, we have this narrative of the defense lawyers fighting class certification to kill meritorious claims and avoid liability, right? So we have those polar opposites. And the idea is really, um, where are we? Is the pendulum swung in one way or the, or the other too far in terms of these two tropes? And I you know, venture to say that neither one is really, um, is, is really uh, what, what, uh, what we're talking about. Um, so the, the question that comes before the court is, is, this, is the class action a joinder device or is it a regulatory device? And uh, we can see, I think the, 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 the jurisprudence sort of leads us in, is, is struggling with that and leads us in the direction of the joinder device over the regulatory one. Um, so in general, is it more difficult for cases to be certified as class actions under the Roberts Court? Well, you can think of that in different ways. And so what I tried to do is I thought about this thematically in basically three different areas. One is looking at whether um, the, uh, the consideration of the merits of class certification, um, how much does that happen and for what types of cases. And so I'll be looking at that, uh, particularly within the context of securities and civil rights cases. Um, another way you might think of the question whether or not the Roberts Court is, um, uh, 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 whether it's more difficult to bring class actions um, would be uh, looking at arbitration and the court's um, 
deference towards the enforceability of arbitration agreements, particularly those that have class action bans embedded in them. And the third way you might uh, look at the question is um, how does the court rule when it comes to a, a company making a Rule 68 offer of judgment or a settlement offer that is not to a named plaintiff, which is not accepted, um, does that function to moot the individual case and ultimately the class action? So those are the three different areas I want to explore for a little bit here. So first of all, the idea of looking at the resolving merits, the class certification stage. So it's a... Um, you know, I'd say it's a mixed bag if we're asking, is it pro-business or pro or pro or not pro-business, pro-plaintiff? Again, those are hard. Um, those are very crude uh, categorizations, but we'll we'll try to we'll try to work within that parameter. So, in the securities area, it seems to be, I would say, sort of pro more pro-plaintiff, or certainly is a mix. Started off pro-plaintiff. Um, good for shareholders and investors. If we look at Amgen and we look at Halliburton, um, the first Halliburton case. Um, so, so Halliburton one started off with a unanimous, uh, a unanimous decision, uh, authored by Chief Justice Roberts, holding that plaintiffs to prove loss causation at the class certification stage. So, um, uh, so there, sort of, again, kind of keeping alive the basic presumption in securities uh, class actions. And that, that case was an unequivocal and unanimous opinion. Amgen, another a beneficial case to shareholders and investors, uh, reaffirming the fraud on the market theory, holding that plaintiffs don't have to prove materiality at the class certification stage. So again, sort of um, protecting the, uh, the, B3, uh, the B3 class. And so in the securities area, it's a Halliburton one and Amgen, uh, basically telling defendants that they could no longer challenge uh, class certification securities fraud cases on the base of loss causation of materiality. That switched, that, um, that sort of favoring, I'd say the plaintiff switched to more of a pro-business um, orientation in Halliburton two. Um, again, a unanimous opinion by Chief Justice Roberts. Um, that said that defendants could put forth um, evidence that the misrepresent the alleged misrepresentation did in fact did not in fact um, affect the stock price or so the market price. And so there is a you know the basic presumption ex uh, survives, but defendants are given an opportunity in fact to challenge that presumption and say that there was a um, a lack of price impact. So you could say in this area, the Roberts Court class action jurisprudence has been favorable to investors and shareholders by keeping that basic presumption alive um, and minimizing the extent to which plaintiffs have to show merits at the class certification stage. But the company, too, has the opportunity to rebut that presumption. And I'd say it's not really clear whether that the... Um, uh, this line of cases really has anything a lot to say about other areas in terms of class action jurisprudence. So I'd say it's a different story when we get to the civil rights context, when we look at the uh, examination of merits at the class certification stage. And of course, this is where, um, you know, the Walmart case is um, somewhat central. Uh, you may um, uh, recall in the Walmart case that the issue there was at the outset that the court uh, decertified the case because it said the commonality was not uh, satisfied um, under Rule 23A2. Uh, this was a 5-4 decision, so clearly, you know, clearly a, a controversial, at least this portion of the decision was a controversial one. Um, this was authored by Scalia and raised the bar for commonality, arguably one of the easiest criteria for class certification supposed to be one single question, one single common question should suffice, and the court said that that wasn't the case here. Um, so not surprisingly, what the court did, it reiterated the importance of having a rigorous analysis when it comes to class certification um, and looking at the merits when they overlap with the class uh, certification determination, and that the plaintiffs had the burden of proving that the Rule 23 criteria were met. Um, what was surprising, at least to... Um, a number of people, myself included, was just the idea that now that bar, the commonality bar had been raised so that plaintiffs had to um, offer significant proof that Walmart had operated under a general policy of discrimination um, in order to satisfy that, that low threshold, that commonality threshold. That had not, had not seen that in the Title VII jurisprudence before, and that has now um, been applied not only in the Title VII context, but in those outside of Title VII. Uh, so what's the impact of Walmart? Certainly there was a lot of buzz. There's been a tremendous, I think, uh, 
hundreds of law review articles by professors uh, who've written in this area. What are the implications of this highly controversial opinion? And, and, and I'd say the implications are really varied. Um, on the one hand, the, the, the case, I would say, has had little impact, uh, little impact on employment discrimination class actions. Um, certainly because of the size and scope of Walmart itself. You can imagine the class is 1.5 million uh, women who are challenging um, alleged gender discrimination nationwide. So not a lot of cases look like that. So they're clearly pushing the envelope in terms of the outer bounds of what you could think holds a case together uh, to satisfy commonality. So as a result, smaller cases, lawyer, uh, plaintiff's lawyers uh, representing um, uh, folks in employment discrimination cases are bringing smaller claims. They're regionally based and those have been more successful. Um, if they're geographically limited. And so you're creating a stronger nexus between the decision maker and the adverse employment action that's being challenged. Um, other ways plaintiff's counsel has adjusted, there are a variety of things that have happened. Um, uh, cases have been successful in terms of issue certification under 23CF, uh, uh, C4, um, creating subclasses, defining the class more narrowly, distinguishing Walmart, and then bringing cases in state court. So all of those things are going on. Um, which would suggest that the impact has not been as large as people might have anticipated. On the flip side, you could say that there has been some significant impact, and that's certainly in the area where the um, the case looks a lot like Walmart. So Walmart is different in terms of its, you know, it's very large and so forth, but not so different in terms of the theory that it was relying on the 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 notion that excessive subjectivity was a vehicle for um, discrimination, and so to the extent that the cases the cases with identical theories um, have not fared well under um, Walmart um, since then, and that's true within Title VII context and even outside of the Title VII context. Um, I will say that that is tempered by circuit court decisions that have um, that have been have have uh, overturned denials of class certification. Um, that deal with some discretion. So it's not as if there are cases that involving discretionary calls are completely off the table, quite the contrary. So the Seventh Circuit, for example, Posner case, um, held that local managers who exercise discretion on the ground, but who are uh, doing that pursuant to a very particular policy at the, you know, at the nationwide level or at headquarters, those are surviving commonality. Or if it turns out, again, there's a case out of the Fourth Circuit, uh, where the um, the uh, the uh, the high level managers themselves, if they are the ones who in fact are exercising that discretion, then they too are surviving commonality. And so it's not as if uh, uh, there is no um, discretionary. Um, it's not as if the discretionary theory is not. Uh, uh, that it's impossible for it to be certified as a class action. So I think it's clear certainly that Walmart has not eliminated class actions, um, even those involving discretionary behavior. Uh, but it's it's important not to underestimate the impact of front loading that inquiry, the merits inquiry at the class certification stage. So that leads to higher costs in terms of discovery, in terms of de delay and so forth. Um, does deter some cases from, in fact, being fi uh, being filed at all. So there's a study that came out that said employment discrimination cases, the filings of those class actions have been on the wane uh, post um, Walmart. Um, and I'd also um, add that the Walmart is tempered by Tyson Foods, um, which allowed representative or aggregate proof to be used, a sampling to be used um, in a class action, despite the the uh, the language Scalia's language coming out of Walmart against a, um, a trial by formula. Um, so turning to uh, arbitration, I think in that area it's more easy to say that there is a there there is a uh, pro I guess you'd say a pro business leaning in that direction here. So the court's preference for the enforceability of arbitration agreements, particularly those that have embedded class action bans. Um, so the court is very deferential to uh, the uh, enforcement of arbitration agreements and businesses are using arbitration agreements and class action bans um, more and more, I think, as a result of that. So there's certainly been a significant increase in the use of arbitration agreements. Um, there was a 2000 study that came out that found at least one out of five of all employees are subject to uh, a mandatory arbitration um, clause. 
Now, the, lo the lower courts are divided on um, to what extent those contracts or those uh, arbitration agreements or contracts of adhesion and are looking at the specific parameters, uh, the specific terms to figure out whether or not they're enforceable. The Supreme Court, um, I would say, has has in every, I don't know, I can't think of, I can't think of a case that hasn't enforced an arbitration agreement um, in certain areas in every manner of contract and in every, an, every every area of law. So the big cases, of course, are going to be AT&T versus Concepcion and Italian colors. So at Concepcion telling us that the uh, Federal Arbitration Act preempts state law that seems contrary to the um, contrary to the to the to to the goals of the FAA, um, even if it is that the state is trying is 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 trying to um, uh, establish uh, guidelines or criteria for unconscionability, saying if there's a class action ban. Um, under certain circumstances that we think that it is um, unconscionable. The court has rejected that and said the FAA preempted California's law in Concepcion. Um, in that case, uh, DirecTV has bolstered that, um, has bolstered that conclusion. And American Express versus Italian Colors is another good example um, where the court, I think, has gone even further in terms of permitting arbitration agreements that foreclose class actions. Um, and they are... Uh, what's interesting about that case um, is that the plaintiffs had established, uh, the, the, the court said that the arbitration, the class action waiver was enforceable even where the plaintiffs had established that um, they would not have been able to pursue their case um, outside of the context of some kind of cost sharing arrangement or some sort of collective action. Uh, it looked like the cost of an expert was um, in the several hundred thousands, maybe even exceeded a million. Um, so it, w it made it um, irrational or impossible for individuals to, in fact, pursue um, the um, antitrust uh, claims that they were making. And even in that context, the court said that, um, that the arbitration agreement was enforceable. And so that was a Scalia decision um, that said even if plaintiffs were, uh, had proved that it was economically infeasible to, to uh, bring the case as an individual um, arbitration that that agreement, the arbitration agreement still forbid them from bringing the case as a class action. Um, certainly given the proliferation of class action arbitration waivers in, in business agreements, consumer agreements, employment agreements, and so forth, I think the impact of Italian colors and Concepcion is going to be pretty, is pretty significant, right? That language is broad and can be applied to various federal statutes beyond the antitrust claims. Um, the other, and then the last um, area that I've looked at, this notion of the court's treatment of uh, what impact would an offer, a Rule 68 offer of judgment or a settlement offer have um, on the viability of a class action. If you make that offer to an individual uh, claim, uh, a named representative, and they don't uh, accept that offer, would that still, could that still moot the individual case and ultimately the class action itself? Uh, it started off a little rocky, the court um, in the Genesis Healthcare Corporation versus Simtech, and ultimately I think got clarified uh, in Campbell Ewald, um, where the court said that um, an unaccepted Rule 68 offer of judgment or unaccepted settlement offer does not moot the plaintiff's claim or the, uh, the class action itself. So it disallowed a company to defeat uh, class action by mooting the putative uh, class representative's individual claim. So I would say that that plaintiff's victory is sort of tempered by this language in the opinion in terms of what the court did not decide. Um, it said that it didn't decide whether or not the result would be different if the, de if the defendant deposited the amount of the, the, amount of the, um, uh, the full amount of the plaintiff's individual claim in an account and if the judge then um, um, entered a judgment for the plaintiff then we, maybe that would do it. So, so sort of we haven't heard the latest of the mootness issue, but that in fact has been teed up already by some circuit courts below who in fact have already started to make rulings in that area. So I'll, I'll just stop here uh, and, and say that the, uh, it's been interesting to think about this because the, um, I think the class action rulings, and there have been quite a few of them, take place within the context of a broader, uh, a broader discussion or a broader orientation 
um, that the court is displaying when it comes to um, access to the courts, when it comes to private enforcement of substantive rights. Um, folks have mentioned Twombly and Iqbal as well. We see similar types of things happening in different directions. And so I think that cumulative effect is something that is worth um, taking uh, taking a, a look at, whether it's discovery or pleadings or class actions and so forth. What we see is a shift in terms of merits being considered front-loading at the, at the beginning of the litigation um, uh, and, and not ultimately getting to the end, whether it's summary judgment or even um, ultimately getting to a jury trial. So uh, we know that procedural cases and procedure in general, um, we have to balance these two competing interests. There's you know, justice on the one hand and efficiency on the other, which is really captured by rule one of the federal rules of civil procedure. Uh, and figuring out the right balance, I think is a tricky um, enterprise. And I think the court is still trying to get that balance right. So 